2023's The Marvels review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I really loved, though I acknowledge it is not perfect. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And I think I will... Yes, so... I realize this is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review, where if I spoil anything, which I'm almost definitely not going to do, but if I decide at some point I'm gonna, that I want to spoil something, I'm going to verbally let you know. Before I do so, hold up an index finger, so you can mute and skip ahead and see me lower my index finger. I will not be warning before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers. Let's see, including discussing the ending. So, yeah, the the movie is rated PG-13, like most of the MCU, and it is not like a hard, you know, so, several of the recent MCU movies and some of the Disney Plus MCU stuff as well has really pushed the PG-13, like, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 really had some some very harsh gore. You know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of gore, but it was really pushing it for a PG-13. It seems like it should probably have been rated R. This doesn't particularly push. There's like there's maybe one thing that's kind of yeah. Um and and certainly, you know, um if you're not a fan of seeing Flarkin, you know, sucking up, using the tentacles, sucking up living sentient beings, yeah, this is definitely, this is not a movie for you. Like, to ask someone you trust to give you a summary. You are not gonna, I don't know, I mean, I guess you could, like, close your eyes and cover your ears for those parts, but it happens more than once. And, you know, it's, the movie thinks it's funny. I agree, but if you don't, you're gonna have a bad time during those parts. You know, it's not played as this thing of, like, oh, you know, that was, that was horrifying, let's never do that again. It's, you know, yeah. And, uh, let's see, yeah, right. Um, I have watched this movie once. I just got back from the theater, like literally as soon as I got in the door, sat down to record this. And let's see. The... Yeah, so the plot, uh, I'm going to quote IMDb here, Carol Danvers gets her powers entangled, those of Kamala Khan and Monica Rambeau, forcing them to work together to save the universe. And, yeah, so, let's get into, so, this was written by Nia da Costa, Megan McDonald, and Elisa Karasik. So, yeah, you know, written by three women, one of whom directed it. And, let's see, yes, so Megan McDonald, you know, in addition to writing the screenplay here, helped write WandaVision. She was story editor, staff writer, and is credited as written by, and she, she has three upcoming episodes of something called Dark Matter, she's, that she's also written, she's directed... Meet Cute, which she also executive produced. Uh, huh. They meet, then it's cute. They meet, it's cute, then it's not. It's a 25 minute video short. Uh, I don't know anything about it. And she produced something called Script Notes. Uh, a discussion, a, a talk show discussion kind of thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, and Elisa Karasik wrote for season one of Loki. So, yeah, it's it's that sort of thing. 
I I don't really have a problem with them using the same people for some of the shows as for for some of the movies. This is not the first time it's happened. I'm not sure what Loki has to do with with this. It made a lot of sense for WandaVision. That was where we met adult Monica Rambeau for the first time. Anyway, and Nia da Costa Let's see. Yeah, she wrote several shorts. Then she co-wrote the Candyman re soft reboot that she also directed. That's right. She's behind Little Woods with Tessa Thompson and Lily James. Yeah, I got a. It's uh, it's on my list. I'd I'd really like to to watch. Um, but yeah. So. That is what I know about their other work, and yeah, the you know these are they they haven't been they they haven't had a ton of like individual projects at least that have come to fruition thus far, but I would say like by and large like they know what they're doing the the you know when you hear oh this is their first project and it's something so big you know you you worry yeah is is this is it too soon for for them to be handling something so big and i do think that there are some issues with the writing i don't think it's on account of a lack of experience, I think it is studio meddling. Uh, you know that they are kind of infamous at this point. They've driven away several really pro. You know, okay, so Joss Whedon. You know, we now know that he's a real bastard. So maybe it's not so bad that he's not working in the MCU anymore. But the Russo brothers you know, yeah, driven out by this excessive meddling. And, yeah, it this movie feels like it has... It feels like they took two different movies and combined them, and then it feels like there's a bunch of, like, studio notes, like, stuff that, you know, they saw, okay, people really responded to this. You know, it's it's very clear, like... It's it's kind of funny to me. Like conservatives are like, ah, nobody cares. Nobody cares about Ms. Marvel. You know, that's that's the thing they say whenever they they can't really think of a good argument for why something's bad. They just say, oh, nobody cares about it. This movie proves quite definitively. Yeah, there are a number of people. I am one of them who love Ms. Marvel, the Disney Plus miniseries, and th there's a lot in this movie that's specifically like paying off on that you know this is one of those cases where like I was legitimately concerned that they were going you know not everything from the show makes an appearance you know that would be impossible but they get the the sense of humor the the chemistry is still very much there and yeah you know the the Kamala's family are not just there for like two seconds and, yeah, there's some really great, like, they still, you know, I said this in, in my review of that show, phenomenal acting. The, the casting really, you know, um, hold on, I believe her name, Sarah Finn, you know, one of the, one of the unsung heroes of, of the MCU. It's, it's unreal how much good she's done. In it, she's she does such a phenomenal job casting these. But yeah, um, let's see. The um, I think that might be about. What? But yeah, the the it definitely like it's this body swap, you know, quirky comedy about these three young women who you know have to work together despite certain issues and then there's this like 
it's 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 one of these it's one of the MCU movies where you watch it and you're like there's something really great here I don't know if like I almost kind of wish that this wasn't MCU not for the you know I I love that the you know I know some people say oh it's homework no it's I mean if you if you don't love comic books I guess it feels like homework I love comic books it's you know with so many individual MCU you know productions movies shows and such it's like reading a novel like you get to really dive deep into this world there's a lot of characters there's a lot of great character moments you know it's, it's the kind of thing you you usually don't get with a movie series you know but the fact that it has to produce all these action scenes and you know the the thing with the fact that they're they're going around to different settings that I didn't think particularly hurt the movie. They get a lot of great stuff out of the different settings, and the the fact that yeah, there you know there has to be a villain, there has to be this overall conflict, and that conflict has to be resolved violently. You know, I, honestly, I I would love to just watch these three young women traveling space. And like working out their issues and becoming a stronger unit, you know. But every so often, it has to do. It's it's, you know, I've, I perhaps the strongest case of that, other than this particular movie in the MCU, is maybe Eternals. You know, that was a movie where I, I was like, you know, okay, yeah, I get it. I'm basically watching people talking, but they're interesting people. They're having very compelling conversations. And then every so often, oh, uh, I mean, it's been like, I don't know, 20 minutes. It's time for another action scene, I guess. I kinda, it's, I'd rather watch these people talk, but okay, here we go, action. You know, and I love action movies. It's not the, so, but yeah. Um, this is also very much like, I want to start by saying not everybody there's a lot of people who are going to love this movie. It is a very specific movie. It's it's fairly niche. I I don't know if this niche already existed or if this movie is creating the niche, uh, you know, but you know, I love a, I I I love almost all the the really interesting decisions that this movie makes. But I acknowledge not everyone is going to, and I will say it's not quite as tight. You know, this is this comes after Guardians of the Galaxy three, and yeah, it's not it's not up to the level of of James Gunn. And I don't say that because he's a guy, and these this movie was made by women. You know, several of my favorite movies were written and directed by women. You know. S stuff like the the Babadook and the 2003 monster it's not it's not a gender thing but I will say there will be a chunk of people who hate this movie I want to make clear not all of them it's not only going to be for misogynistic reasons the it is definitely a movie that on honestly I do think there's probably a lot of women who are going to watch this and it's just not quite going to be for them. And I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouths, but I wouldn't rule out some people might feel like it's... Some people might feel like it's maybe pandering. Like it's, it's saying, okay, we get that we've been making movies that perhaps you know, we've been making primarily for boys, here's one for girls, and look how much of a, you know, it didn't bother me, but I'm, you know, I'm not the person primarily being pandered to. Um, let's see, the, the, yeah, you know, it's, the, the misogynists who are gonna hate this movie, part of it is definitely gonna be because of their misogyny, but not everyone who's going to hate this movie is actually misogynist. 
uh, you know what, I'm going to dive into, there's a really great quote, uh, let's see, let's see, so the, yes, um, one critic, uh, Louisa Moore from Screen Zealots, said, Da Costa fully and unapologetically embraces the girliness of her movie. There's a musical number, a dreamboat prince, and oodles of cuddly kittens, all of which add a little tongue-in-cheek nod to the overall femininity that's present here. That's very true. It's a... yeah. And, and that is 100%. Some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it. You know, there's there will be, you know, if they are not warned, there will be insecure straight cis men who are going to run out of the theater screaming at certain scenes. And, I mean, I can't be there to point and laugh at every single one of them, but I would like to. No, it's just, it's, I, I love when a movie is just willing to unapologetically be itself and do the thing that it wants to do. I wish the movie went further, you know, and, and it also, like, every so often, like, it, it goes very close to, to really interesting ideas. Like, there's this thing of, you know, is Carol Danvers maybe not amazing at working with other people? Which is a very interesting thing to to do with you know in in the first movie she doesn't have a lot of flaws and i was i was hoping that this would you know i i would definitely say parts of this movie tries to go there i don't think it fully embraces it and it, again it's not like it's not that i want to see a powerful woman torn down it's just there's not a lot to her character so far and that's too bad because you can make you know once again you know 2003's monster and the babadook are both movies about women who are passionate and strong in some ways but who do who also struggle with certain things and you know just i'm i'm not saying you know you're going to have more fun watching one of those two movies than you will at this. But, you know, if, I'm, if, if I have about two hours and I, I want to feel something really deeply about a female lead, yeah, it's, I'm probably going to pick one of those two movies over this. And um, this movie is also not quite as... I think I probably talk about it too much, but it's relevant. This movie is not quite as amazing as the the Birds of Prey movie, the the Harley Quinn girl gang movie, which I I'm aware a number of people really didn't connect with, and you know that's the you know their loss. That movie is more willing to confront the fact that some of these young women, they're not necessarily good people, and that doesn't mean that they should just, like, sit in a corner for the rest of their lives. It means you can do better. You know, there's a, there's a chance for redemption there. And that's the kind of thing that this movie never completely... There are times where the characters will acknowledge, you know, that was a mistake. That was, you shouldn't have done that that way and they're they're trying I really appreciate I see them trying love it I I wish it got quite you know just a little further. and I really I do not think that's Nia DaCosta I'm fairly confident that's Marvel because uh, Disney because Nia DaCosta does an amazing job confronting you know it, in in the Candyman reboot it's not as much like young women. It's 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 young black people, probably it's especially young black men, you know. But but yeah, there's a real willingness to confront, you know, this this kind of thing. And and again, that just 
that's a more interesting story. There are a lot of movies about you know stuff like slavery and such and the the I'm I'm not saying those shouldn't exist, but I do think it's very interesting to to make these movies, you know, and and yeah, now it sounds like a race thing. I don't need my movies to I I don't need the movies and, and stuff I watch. I don't need the minorities to be flawed. It's just that comes across as more interesting uh, to me. Uh, you know, it doesn't make me think, oh, that entire group of minorities is bad. It makes me to try to understand the individual better. And I think that... Oh, wait, let's see. There, I feel like there was at least one other thing about Birds of Prey. Yeah, the action in that movie far surpasses uh, that of, of this. The The... Yeah, the female characters are much more complex, and yeah, there's a there's a willingness for them to be much darker. You know, the the like Margot Robbie specifically, like she, you know, at at one point she caught them like trying to make Harley Quinn too appealing, and she was like, "No, Harley's a bad person, and that's important," and that comes through in that movie, and yeah. You know, Disney are not willing to to put that you know this much this big of a budget behind something that gets that dark. And let's see, I think that is about yeah. So worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all the movies of the MCU other than this one. At the end of the review, I will update with where this movie fits in. Iron Man 2, Dark World, Black Widow, Captain America 1, Thor 1, Ragnarok, Hulk, Ant-Man 1, Ant-Man 2, Thunder, Homecoming, Doctor Strange 1, Iron Man 3, Iron Man 1, The Avengers 1, Ultron, Ant-Man 3, Madness, Far From Home, No Way Home, Guardians of the Galaxy, Holiday Special, Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2, Black Panther 1, Winter Soldier, Werewolf, Shang-Chi, Eternals, Guardians 3, Wakanda Forever, Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame. And, uh, right, so, yeah, um, you don't need to have watched, and, and you certainly don't need to have watched recently, the, the first Captain America, Captain Marvel movie, Ms. Marvel, or WandaVision. Honestly, hypothetically, like, this could be the first MCU thing you watch. I kind of want, like, if that's you, if this was the first MCU movie you watched, please hit me up in the comments. I would be fascinated to know. Because technically, like, I, I, you know, pay very close attention. And yeah, technically, everything you need to understand this movie appears at some point in this movie. It's a bit like Age of Ultron that way, you know, just, you know, um, I don't think every single MCU movie necessarily does, you know, I, S Civil War, you know, which I just mentioned is one of my favorites, is definitely a movie that you need to have watched. You know, what I, what I say is, if you if you don't have time to watch very much before Civil War, just watch Age of Ultron because that one will bring you up to speed on almost everything, and the rest you can surmise. But let's see, it it is definitely a movie that you know a, a lot of the stuff hits harder if you have been following closely. It is it is one of those things where. The, the, yeah, um, Secret Invasion came and went recently, and that one had some really evil scrolls, which was not really the case in the first Captain Marvel movie, and this one kind of acts like it doesn't, yeah, um, They've the the continuity has slipped a little bit here recently, and let's 
see. Right, so yeah, the the um, Yeah, the the let's see. One of uh yeah, I wrote about one of the trailers that looks excellent, very funny, and tells us just enough. Yeah, so that definitely wasn't what I wrote about the most recent trailer, which tells us too much. Now, it is at this point a predictive law that you can only keep making science fiction movies for so long before at least one of them will be a body swap story. And, yeah, you know, this movie... The, the, this movie did not get there before the DCEU. You know, they, they put out two body swap stories. Both of them Shazam movies. And, let's see, I can imagine that this movie, like, some of the, some of the trailer stuff appeals very much to those of us who care about Kamala Khan because of the Ms. Marvel show, and who already have a connection to the adult Monica Rambeau because of WandaVision, I can imagine that, you know, it, again, it's not the case that, you know, so, so far the MCU has not put out, put a movie in theaters that requires you to have watched an MCU, a, a Disney Plus only MCU thing in order to follow it. There might be stuff where you're, you know, it doesn't hit the same if you didn't watch the thing on Disney Plus, but you know, and and I can imagine at some point it might actually happen, but it hasn't so far. But this is definitely something where it's not gonna appeal as much to you. I also I, I saw you know I, I read some reviews of this movie today, and some people apparently found, at least one person said that they found Kamala Khan annoying, which, I mean, I will say they they push her character to be, you know, if, even if you didn't find her annoying on the, the Disney Plus show, you might find her annoying here. I didn't, but I have a very high threshold for the, this sort of thing, and I, it just, you know, I... Her character is adorable. I you you have to really push it extremely far to to for it to become too much. By the way, I really hope like Iman Vellani has really proven she deserves a career. Like so far, this is the only yeah. Uh, let's see, she's. Yeah, according to IMDb, the, these are the only, the, this MCU stuff is the only stuff that she's been, uh, been in. Which, you know, also, fair enough, like, the, the Disney Plus show was only last year. Uh, but, yeah, it, it absolutely is, like, she deserves a career. She is so freaking talented, but the, the... Um, yeah, I, I can imagine the the people who are only watching them theatrical movies, they're not necessarily going to respond as well to the the trailers, you know, focusing on these characters that they haven't met in any of the movies before this one, and you know, sadly, you know, yeah, mentioned you know a lot of misogynists. I hate Brie Larson because she challenges their idea of what women are allowed to say, think, and do. I can imagine this movie might suffer some from that, and I've heard some theorize that it might actually outright, like, fail, you know, and, you know, it's, it's possible. I hope that won't be the case, but, yeah, it's, it's... Uh, if if that happens, I really hope that they don't that that the studios don't look at it and say, oh, we shouldn't let women direct. We shouldn't have black people having so much control or being, you know, having having people of color, women of color in the leads and and 
this sort of thing or have such a you know female centric kind of movie you know I, I really don't think that those things are yeah I, I come on fellas there are so many of these movies that are specifically for us and a lot of women you know a lot of girlfriends accept being dragged along to these movies let's support you know when like I really I do hope in the future there will be way more of these made that are for people who aren't white and male and I just realized I I meant to say earlier the things I say about like feminism representation in general and such I try to base on I, I haven't seen very much for this movie yet since it just came out I try to base that on what I've seen actual female feminists and and you know people of color and such in in YouTube videos how they respond to to certain representation and and issues and being covered and such now yes one thing I was wondering about this movie was if it would tell us what Carol Danvers has done in the intervening years let's see and yes um, we do get we are told some of what has what she's been doing in in the in-between and you know it's, I've, I I forget if I've put it in a video yet but I thought of you know years ago I thought of the following. Until we get something in one of these movies that contradict the following, my head canon is that she was present during the events of the first two Avengers movies. It's just that she and Nick Fury kept it hidden from everybody else, like with the events of the of her first solo movie. I love that there are actually people who watch the entire first Captain America solo movie, Captain Marvel solo movie, and immediately made up their minds that despite the fact that they had literally just watched a movie that stated authoritatively that Carol Danvers heroically intervened and it was kept secret from almost everyone until the release of the movie, showed audiences, really other than her and Nick Fury and some other S.H.I.E.L.D. people, no one knew. Despite that, they are certain that it can't possibly have happened more than this one time. Like, if that was your theory before you watched the movie, fine, but tons of people claim this after watching it, and it's like, do you not understand what a retcon is? Because, like, this is a comic book franchise. Retcons are all over the, the just, yeah. So, let's see the... Yeah, so, yeah, WandaVision implies there is some secret that the government knows about Photon and her dealings with Carol Danvers. Maybe this is just what happened in the first movie, but if not, does this movie explain what it is? Maybe the reason that Photon in WandaVision seems upset with Carol Danvers let's see, is all those years where they weren't together. But if not, does this movie explain what it is? And, yes, the, the by the end of this movie, you will understand what that was about. So this is the third movie in a row of MCU films that are either set in space or the quantum realm. The other two, Ant-Man 3 and Guardians 3, both have gross technology. Squelchy, nasty, slimy, goopy. I wish I could say that this completed the hat trick, but it does have other really super weird stuff, which, like, I really appreciate. Like, can we, can we just knock off this like oh you know space space is just kind of laid back it's maybe a little sleeker maybe a little cooler maybe some people have weird letters in their names and pronounce words funny but other than that it's kind of like earth whatever it's not a big deal. no it's space this is science fiction like unless you don't have a budget just no go nuts this is what we watch this stuff for like if you don't want it to be that different from Earth. Like, why wouldn't we just be watching something that's actually set on Earth? So, yeah, I, I really appreciate this. This movie has something that's like, okay, you know what? Fair enough. Only in space. Nowhere on Earth could you have that experience. And let's see. So, yeah, the, the first Captain Marvel solo movie was in part a mystery 
and there is a little bit of mystery in this, but it's not to the, the same extent. I will definitely say that is one of the things. There are things in this movie where it's like, okay, you people responded to it when that thing was in the first Captain Marvel movie, and now you're bringing it back, even though it's kind of awkward, and it's just very, very obvious that you're like, we did the thing. You, you liked the thing before. We're doing it again. That means you like it again. And not all of it is bad. Some of it is legitimately quite good. But I, I yeah, it's... They do the thing where they where they look at someone's memories and rewind and and such and it just it does not feel anywhere near as organic like literally in the first movie it makes perfect sense why it's happening and it also we don't realize right away that that's what is or we're not told right away we you know you can maybe piece it together that's a, that that's what's happening but it's not explained we're not. They don't sit us down and say, okay, so this is what we're going to do. It's just, we're seeing these memories, and then, oh, rewind, and, and like, Carol in the memories is, like, hearing the voice. It's like, do you hear that, too? Is that, you know, and, like, the memory is replaying, and she's aware of it. Like, they, they do the, it's, it's like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and then in this, it's just like, oh, well, it was in the first one. And, like, when they start doing it, one of the characters is even like, do we really have to do this? And I'm like, I, I'm kind of on her side with, with this. Now, the, let's see. Yeah, and the first Captain Marvel and this movie both have cool alien settings and technology. And... Yeah, the first movie has a carefully curated soundtrack. It's not quite James Gunn, but it's not nothing. This one goes for, for some of that. There's definitely there's a needle drop or two that are very fun. You know, they're... Actually, yeah, tell you what. At, at least one of the needle drops is better. You know, I'm, I'm not one of the people who say, oh, you know, the needle drops of the first movie are just terrible. You know, I agree that they're not quite as... They're not as effective as the movie wants them to be, but I really don't think that they're, like, a big deal. At least not in a bad way. And, let's see, the... Yeah, so this is the first time that we see the, the trio on screen, and they do have good chemistry with each other. We've only seen the child version of Monica with Carol which was a different actress. It's been years since the two characters spent time together, and it will be the first time either of them meet Kamala. And, yeah, they, they have a lot of fun with the... Yeah, and, and also some dramatic moments with the fact that they're working together, because it really is like, you know, this thing of the, the their powers being tied, that is basically why it is the three of them, no more, no less, and no one else really, you know, in, involved in this, and it's the kind of thing, if, if not for the fact that it, as contrived as it can get in this, you know, they get, they do get some really great stuff out of it, and that's, I'm, I'm in favor of, if they get something you know, contrivance sucks if it's because they don't know what they're doing, and they're just like, I don't, dude, we, uh, we ran out of money or, or, you know, running time or something. We just gotta get this out of the way. I don't know what I'm doing. Throwing my hands in the air and and whatever, you know, that sucks. But contrivance to accomplish something, you know, is much less frustrating. And let's see. So, yeah, the, the first movie is about Carol Danvers being gaslighted by Jan Rog. Obviously, very important, relevant topic. There are a lot of men gaslighting women. There have been, you know, probably as long as we've had societies. And let's see. Yeah, I don't... I'm not sure that I would 
quite say that this movie there are definitely things that it's doing but I don't know if you know es essentially it's this thing of the the uh, let's see I wrote it here somewhere let's see yeah, yeah. So, uh, real quick, let's see. I'm just going to make sure that I can still find... There we go. Yeah, so, yeah, the first uh, of these two films, the first Captain Marvel film, one woman on her own in a world of men, and this one, it's three different women working together in a world of men that women can change for the better. Less Western, both part of the world and genre, movie genre, more progressive, more appealing to younger generations who are more about forming community and helping each other where, you know, boomers and other older generations believe more in individualism. Not all of them, not absolutely every single individual. They are all different. But, you know, that's, that's what the studies say, you know. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I wouldn't quite say that it's... It's not as important of a topic, and it's, yeah, it, it feels like with, with that one, they were more willing to, you know, yeah, of, of, the, of the three of these, it is the least chance-taking, risk-taking of the, the MCU female-centric, you know, of, of these movies. The... the um, let's see, yeah, you know, Black Widow was about, you know, a, a trafficked woman fighting with, with her, you know, used, fighting alongside her trafficked sister and her parents who helped with the trafficking to take down a trafficker who literally says young women are an expendable resource, you know, so, yeah, the, the, and, and I, I do want to say, I don't think that this movie is worse off for the fact that the central antagonist is female, I actually do think that adds to the, you know, because the, the, sometimes the, the people who hurt women and feminism are women, other women, you know, and the, the, yeah, this movie, you know, there, there is this, like, they never let it devolve to, like, a, a chick fight, but it is, you know, it's, it's one woman who wants revenge on another woman, and the, the, yeah, you know, some sometimes that is really destructive for women and, and feminism as a whole. And yeah, I, I quite appreciate that they, you know, tackled that. Now, let's see. Yeah, so yeah, in the in the first movie, Carol, especially when she identifies with the Kree, has this responsible older sister or mother energy with Fury. And yeah, I would definitely say they try for that some here with, with Kamala. It doesn't come across quite as strongly. And let's see. Yeah, the first movie, Carol piecing together her real identity from before the Creed brainwashing is legitimately touching. And this movie tries for something similar. And yeah, yon Rog is one of those antagonists we love to hate in the first Captain Marvel. Yeah, this, this movie, uh, let's see, her name is Dar Ben. She's sadly one of the less interesting of the the MCU villains, which, yeah, it's 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 too bad. Again, I really hope that they don't take take away from this. Oh, no more female villains, I guess. 
because it has nothing to do with with that and also it does not seem to me that it's like the actress's like talent or such I, th I think the movie would have been better if they had been willing to really unleash Darben instead of uh, yeah ADHD acting up and I do actually have ADHD I know some people say that when what they mean is just oh I'm having a little trouble focusing no I I have been diagnosed ADHD and I know some people get really frustrated when if if they are not aware that it's ADHD they think oh I guess he doesn't care or something uh, let's see yeah and the first movie has empathy for refugees at a time when that is sadly in short supply the hero helps them protects them tries to get them a home the villain the villains try to kill them including children after taking away their home through needless armed conflict and this movie does have some scrolls that we empathize with but it doesn't similarly do the the yeah um it doesn't get to you the way that it did in in that movie in the first movie Brie Larson is only rarely allowed to give strong acting performance it's not her fault and yeah i think this you know she's a much better actress than it comes across in in yeah in, in these couple of movies, they don't quite know what to do with the character. And that's, you know, that's the biggest problem for the, for the character, for, for the, for the acting of the character, at the very least. And, yeah, in the first movie, Carol takes some enjoyment in using her powers near the end, where she's able to use them unrestrained, and... Yeah, there's some of that in this, and uh, I think that might be about um, yes, that is definitely something that I want to uh, hold on. I will just really quickly copy that in because that is definitely something that I want to talk about. But it has spoilers. So there we go. So the yeah, ultimately the MCU did not have a huge amount of adorable fanboy moments when where Peter Parker was geeking out over Tony Stark after they met and ones that appear on camera. This one has a bunch with Kamala and Carol, and they're just, it's so precious. Just, it's, yeah, um, they're, they're so much fun. And Iman Vellani is one of the best parts of this movie. She's selling every frame of just, like, yeah. And I think that might be... Yeah, and yeah, the body swap forces them to work together, even though they're not 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 all three necessarily love that situation from right away. So we have a South Asian teenager, a white adult, and a black adult female realizing their causes and actions affect one another, like feminism developing to embrace non-white women, which it sadly did not always do. And yeah, this movie is in part about Carol does not have to shoulder the burden alone, which, you know, before this movie, in the MCU, that is kind of how she saw herself, you know, and yeah, so the Dar Ben is kind of like a mix of Ronan and Malekith, you know, there's not, there's not a huge amount of difference between her and Ronan with an A, not an I, and the, the, yeah, um, she even has the hammer, which I think was not the smartest choice, um, Lee Pace 
Like, I know some people really don't like that villain. I disagree, but they're entitled to their opinion, of course. I... <sighs> Lee Pace makes an impression. And... Um, Darben is played by Zawa Ashton. And I would like to see her in other stuff. I don't think it's it's her fault. But it is difficult to, to try to top something like that, and also just the way that a Ronin is presented is often more, like, visually cinematic. Like, when we first meet Ronin, you know, we, we, we see him rise from this bath, and you have these, like, his servants throwing this, like, d d dust or sand on him, and, like, lowering the armor onto him. And the first time we see Darben in this... And, and, you know, you hear him give this monologue about, like, his philosophy. The first time you see Darben in this, she's just standing, waiting for people working for her to do a thing, and then watching them do that thing. It's not, there's no, like, one shot that's, like, wow, that's the villain. And, yeah, it's just, it's it's too bad. Um, let's see, and... Yeah, like Malekith, it's this thing of, you know, an old personal revenge kind of thing. And, yeah, uh, Ronan and Malekith are perhaps the two most hated MCU villains. So, yeah, it was not an incredibly smart choice, I don't think. I mean, I get it, uh, you know, Kree, so... There's going to be some similarity to, to Ronan, but, yeah. Uh, let's see. I think... Yeah, so, um... Yeah. This is sillier and goofier than other recent MCU, which makes a lot of sense, because two of the three leads last appeared in comedy shows on Disney+. Plus. And I do think they do a good job of bridging that gap, which is, of course, like, it's impossible to do it completely without any, like, awkwardness, because, like, WandaVision has very little action, and Ms. Marvel does not have the scope of this movie. So for them to, to try to, to go from, from one to the other, you know, it's... Yeah, the the... There's always, there's definitely going to be some, some awkwardness there. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending does fit with what came before. Uh, yeah, I, I quite like how the movie ends. So this has one mid credit scene and... I, th I saw someone say, oh, there's like an audio thing at the end of the the credits, but as far as I could tell, there's no actual like scene there, so I didn't stay until the very end of the credits. The mid-credits scene does happen at the end of the first chunk of, of credits. I meant to write down, but I forgot to uh, exactly how many minutes of credits, but it's not a huge amount. If I had to guess, maybe three, five minutes or so. And yes, you will definitely want to, to stay for the, the mid credit scene. And there's going to be some people who say this was the wrong story to put that mid credit scene in. But yeah, I definitely... I am, I am very excited to see what they do next with something from the mid credits scene so the the characters uh, let's see I think yeah uh, I I pretty much had all that I had to say about Carol Danvers I will add um, the so yeah Wikipedia. Since the events of Avengers Endgame, Danvers has mostly been off Earth in deep space, with Larson saying she's kind of become a workaholic. She lost touch with her heart, with family and friends. Now, the. 
yeah, so Monica, uh, once again played by Tayona Paris, the character is slightly hampered by the, you know, they, they do the melodramatic thing of she's struggling to forgive Auntie Carol. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's, other than that, I do think, you know, the, the character is a lot of fun to, to watch, and it is very cool, you know, yeah, so, so, Wikipedia describes it as, she has the ability to manipulate all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, on WandaVision, we saw her start to learn her power. You know, that's where she gets her powers. That's where she starts to learn how to use them. With this, the, the you know, she has now fully, um, what's the word? Fully, she she masters the powers, but before this starts, and let's see. So the yeah, I don't have much to add about Iman Valani as Kamala. Uh, let's see. I think that might be what I have to say. Right, and yeah, Sam Jackson as Nick Fury is is yet again fun to see. You know, this is this is not the the dark and dour Fury of Secret Invasion, which I do still. You know, that was something I did like about that show. You know, really, my main problem with that show was how just bafflingly ill-conceived it was to to start demonizing the refugees after the first Captain Marvel did such a, a great job. Like, there are ways to work around... anyway. And I think that might be about... Yeah, so... I th let's see. Yes, that brings us. Yeah, uh, some of the dialogue is definitely kind of kind of awkward and just doesn't completely. I think they did it when it comes to the exposition. I think they did it the the best they could because the this is a movie that has to explain three power sets to potential newcomer audiences as well as the the body swap thing and other sci-fi you know pop yeah pop comic book sci-fi concepts you know it's not like hard sci-fi it's not stuff that's like oh wow can you imagine if this, it's it's the goofy kind of you know which is what we want but it's a lot for them to have to you know and, and every so often you know someone will explain it in a very technical way and then someone else will be like what does that mean and they'll you know dumb it down a shade i i think they they probably did the best they could with that um that's the thing with you know once you have this much like, I would say maybe, you know, we should try to convey it in a, in a more visual way instead of, you know, verbally explaining. But there's so much detail by this point. It's, it's very difficult to get it all across without actually having people explain. But, yeah, it does have an, a negative a somewhat negative effect. The cinematography with this was handled by Sean Bobbitt, who has 58 credits as cinematographer. And 
yeah, he also did Widows, which I quite, I, I love that movie. Um, right, he did, yeah, Byzantium, and I think that's all that I've seen of it, but definitely, that's right, yeah, he, he did 12 Years a Slave, which I hear is really well shot. Yeah, you know, with without a doubt, it is, like, the, the, he is very talented. And there are times in this when he's allowed to actually employ his talents. You know, there are scenes that are really, really nicely shot and lit. But... You know, this is the MCU. There's a, a somewhat flat quality to a, a lot of it. It's you know, it's very house style. So, yeah, it's which again, you know, coming months after Guardians of the Galaxy three is is very underwhelming. You know, and in some ways, this does feel like I I don't. I'm not 100% certain if they were, maybe they, they decided to make this so Guardians-y back when they thought that either there wouldn't be a Guardians 3 or that James Gunn would not be the one making it, or maybe it was after he was rehired and they were like, let's try to, you know, make more than one like that. It just doesn't quite... it. One of the things is that James Gunn, again, this is not a gender thing, one of the things is James Gunn has been given a lot of freedom. They, you know, after a while they, they gave him a lot of leeway, they, they trusted him. And, yeah, he just, he he's very carefully planned out every little thing where there's definitely stuff in this that feels like, okay, that was added in because someone was like, oh, well, it worked well in this other thing where we did something similar, so let's just do it again and hope it works as well, divorced from the original context. Yeah. Um, this was edited by Katrin Hedstrom, who has 14 total credits as editor, and Evan Schiff, who has 23. And he edited Birds of Prey, so, yeah, the fact that that one was more carefully planned when it came to action. I, I will say, there's at least one part in this where it's like, okay, yeah, they really, they were careful with planning that bit of action. And there's some fun scenes, there's a, there's at least one montage, which is... Very, very fun, very just, like, light and just, yeah, puts a smile on your face, you know. For for that kind of thing, it, it works really well, but again, otherwise, a lot of house style. And I'm not really familiar with, uh, yeah, Katrin also edited Candyman, and that's... That's it for what I am familiar with. But but yeah. You know, they know they they do know what they're doing. They're not Yeah. And the 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 music was handled by Laura Karpman, who has composed for one hundred and fifty two projects. Right, yeah, she also composed for Ms. Marvel, which you know, may well be why she's back. And she did a fantastic job on that. You know, better job on that than here, which again feels like, they, you know, there were limitations. And, yeah, a lot of stuff she composed for I am just not familiar with. Now... Let's see. 
that is about it for the technical aspects. Right, so the this was hold on. there we go. Yes, this was filmed some some of this was filmed on location in Italy. There was also some like ah, what's it called? Some of it was like shot in, in studio. But yeah, um they went to Calabria, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it's probably as close as I'm going to be able to get to pronounce it correctly. And, and you know, New Jersey, that is where Kamala lives. It's, you know, the, the one downside, she does technically live in New Jersey. And, yeah, they got a lot out of it. I really, I'm, I'm so glad that they actually filmed in, in Italy because, holy crap, like, just... You see some of it in the in the trailer, but it it's gorgeous. Like you know, just it it looks absolutely amazing, and just yeah, I I they they made the exact right choice there, and then we have the. Yeah, there's some really great sound design, and yeah, so this movie, let's see, that's right, I did, I, yeah, so I forgot to note exactly when the, the end credits started, but the mid-credits scene, let's see, between, yeah, um, so that is one hour and forty minutes between the the movie starting and the mid credit scene concluding. And I definitely do think, you know, I don't think this is a movie that would have benefited with much more much more running time unless they were also able to to fit in more substance, you know, the, the again, the the so yeah, it's like 45 minutes shorter than Guardians of the Galaxy 3. You know, that movie... I wouldn't say that this movie felt long or longer than that one. But it definitely... Yeah, you know, if I'm sitting down to watch one of the two, it's almost definitely going to be Guardians. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you're if you're watching it in a situation where you could hypothetically, you know, stop watching partway through, yeah, if the first half hour doesn't really hook you, you may want to stop watching. So the yes, that brings us to the the best elements, you know, the the relationship between the three superpowered women, the the when it actually goes for like tackling relationship issues and like you know if you make a mistake what do you do to you know how how far are you willing to go to fix it and the yeah just when you know the times where it is unabashedly like a very feminine movie the the worst aspect is the 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 parts where it holds back the the parts where it has to adhere to it has to deliver certain things because this is you know a a big blockbuster movie so there has to be x amount of action scenes and such now i have not read that many yeah, I, so I read some negative reviews. Most of those things I've already brought up. Let's see. Yeah, I would definitely say, you know, one that some people I'm sure will, there will definitely be some people who find Kamala to be overly annoying. You know, the, the trailer, the, the teaser trailer gives you a good idea. You know, the part where, 
like she body swaps and she's like screaming oh help you know if you find that to be annoying yeah the movie's probably gonna annoy you with with her character her scenes so the thing I was most worried about was some of the characters getting lost and ultimately that didn't really happen. The thing I was most looking forward to was Kamala Khan and Carol Danvers together and there it absolutely delivered. The final trailer gives too much away. Uh, ultimately, really, all of them do, but, you know, it's especially that final one and... The trailers do give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. And let's see, the cover and poster do not give too much away and give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. So, the let's see, on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 61% based on 171 reviews, 105 fresh, average rating of 5.90. I will say some of the reviews I read really sounded like you would have figured it would be lower. And it is, you know, it's an aggregate. It doesn't mean that, yeah, just to, to keep that in mind. Uh, the consensus. Funny, refreshingly brief, and elevated by the chemistry of its three leads, The Marvels is easy to enjoy in the moment, despite its cluttered story and jumbled tonal shifts. There are no audience ratings, or not enough, at least, yet. And on Metacritic, it has a 50 out of 100, mixed or average, 47% mixed, 38% positive and 16% negative reviews and uh, let's see yeah I'll just very briefly so some of the negative ones one said in order bland annoying and misused I can see what they mean one say all involved deserve better um, the shortest of the films yet is also the most interminable and not of nightmares that groans the series now trademark VFX sloppiness. The Marvels is just that kind of production, a whiteboard of sticky notes that magically coalesces slowly and grudgingly into a feature-length motion picture that merely acts as a long advertisement for the next. I, I see what they mean, I wouldn't go anywhere near that far, but yeah. And yeah, another says at least it's short. And um, yeah, one person said it's the worst. It's it's terrible. The worst film yet in the MCU. And on oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It it does not. There are no user ratings for the on for, for film on IMDb. And yeah, so the if I would not say that the effects are quite at there's some there's some really bad CG in Ant-Man 3 especially when it comes to to Modoc. I don't think there's anything in this that's as bad as that, but there are definitely parts where it's like okay, I can I can tell that Brie Larson is not actually flying through space right now. And I know that sounds silly, but I'm just saying sometimes you know there's that thing about, you know, Harrison Ford was quoted on the set of the first X-Men by, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but he played the the senator, I'll have it momentarily, um, 
Bruce Davison, who played Senator Kelly. You know, he said, I feel like Harrison Ford saying, you're going to add in the effects later, so I don't look like a complete a-hole here. That's something that came to my mind as I was watching Brie Larson acting like she was in space and the effects not really selling that. Uh, I do, yeah, I didn't think that they were, like, just completely terrible throughout, but they're definitely not super impressive. You know, if, if you're big on, like, special effects, this is not really a movie that you need to watch in theaters for that. There are some really great uh, stunt uh, scenes. And, yeah, um, I would love to give this higher, but ultimately this is seven triple servings of Marvelous Women out of ten. And, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure this is a movie that's, you know, I, I'm having to guess, you know, how people are going to, receive it because I haven't seen very much yet. I don't think this is a movie that people are going to be bowled over by and I'm not sure that's something that's going to change in the future. And yes, so yes, I'm going to place the movie in the overall ranking. of the of the MCU and yeah it's um, it is it is above Ant-Man 2 and just below Love and Thunder and I am not the biggest fan of Love and Thunder so that helps tell you yeah I wish I could place it higher but I try to be brutally honest in in these and let's see yeah that is it for the review so let's dive in to notes taken while watching so spoilers for the marvels and everything else mcu throughout the rest of this video so yes before i dive in i just wanted to say i really you know maria rambo so cool in the first captain marvel movie and you know yeah, cool character, one of the best actors. You know, I going into this movie, I was hoping, oh, maybe they can do some flashbacks, uh, you know, and they did manage to fit her into Doctor Strange 2. We did get flashbacks, and according to the mid credit scene, you know, in this parallel universe, she is still alive, though she, I guess, never had a, a daughter. But yeah, that's I'm I'm really really glad that they found a way to to bring her back. So yes, to chronological notes, the the logos focus on the trio, the Marvels, and yeah, we see the. Um, Dar Darben. We see Darben find the the bangle, and I did I did chuckle at the thing. You know, uh, wh where's the other bangle? Elsewhere, elsewhere, New Jersey. You know, just, yeah, and. <laughs> Muniba Khan, you know, says you're 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 supposed to be doing homework. Are you doing homework? 
yes, mom, and she's like drawing, and we get one of the animations, which I will say that was one thing that they got, you know, that they ported over from the show that I was not at all unhappy to see, you know, and, and working it in as like, oh, it's one of her, like, what's the word? It's like um, a daydream, essentially, you know, this is not like, she didn't make that, yeah, she, she drew some drawings and imagines that they're moving. It's not like when she did the animation of, of the endgame battle that we saw in Ms. Marvel, the, the Disney Plus show. And I appreciate her pointing out why our hands so hard to draw. Was that line straight up written by one of the animators or something? Because I feel that's like distinctly, I've heard so many different artists individually express that they hate drawing hands. So, yeah. And... <laughs> so adorable when she, you know, she's like, you know, oh, your name's, you know, you're, you're Carol Danvers, Mi Captain Marvel. I'm Ms. Marvel. Seriously? Twinsies! <laughs> and then when, when they actually meet, she's like, Twinsies? It's just, it's just, yeah, so adorable. And, yeah, earlier that day, this movie is not the best at providing a clear, coherent narrative. And it, I will also say, like, I, I mentioned in the review the thing of how, like, it is it is a distinctly, like, what's the word? It is very contrived, this thing of, you know, the, the power, um, the quantum entanglement, I think, the, the way, yeah, the entanglement, you know, so... Okay, Kamala, it's because she's wearing the bangle. But both Carol and Monica, I mean, it's not supposed to be like the exact same moment. I think it's just like around the same time that both of them like touch this thing that's connected to the bangle and connected to, to Darben. Based on the trailers, I thought, oh, Darben pulled some, like, magic thing to, in order to be doing the, the, what's the word? That's, that's why they're entangled. You know, she wanted to, to make them to struggle to fight her. But, no, it's just, like, ridiculous, completely, yeah, I, I don't think it would have been a terrible idea if they had written it as, you know, Darben and her scientists discover, oh, you know, we won't be, f you know, in addition to Carol Danvers, there are others that could be dangerous to us, let's try taking them all out at once, you know, let's make it so that if if two of them use their powers at the same time, they swap places. The, the fact that it happened with that, I know, it's a comedy, it's not, you know, we're not supposed to, like, take it super serious, I think it was pushing it a little bit too far. And... Let's see. Yeah, and, and we see Carol's flashbacks. And Nick Fury calls Carol and see that... That just happens all the time now, I guess? Now that he's on Saber? It just, I don't know, it felt a little... Like, we made this big thing about, oh, you know, she was very difficult to get a hold of, and... Now she's just kind of, yeah, I, I, I agree it's funny, 
I agree. We've been like, oh, what's going on there? And, and he can like just press a button and talk to her. That is funny. That is, you know, the laughs on us. But I can appreciate. It. I can respect a good troll. I I think it would. I I wish that they had added a little bit more. Just just have someone point out, you know. So you know, oh, all this all these years where we didn't know where you were and. It's just a press of a button and talk to you. Mm -hmm. Well, all right then, you know, some, something like that. And yeah, Monica does not want to talk to Carol just yet. And that was the thing. Like I thought, oh, you know, because of the like they're static and they're scrambling. There's gonna be okay. okay to be fair. I think I would have disliked that more. I thought they were going to have the thing where, you know, the one person says something that, like, essentially is innocuous, but because there's static to the other person, it sounds, like, really, like, harsh. You know, but, yeah. I prefer it this way. But as it is, yeah, the fact that there was static, it just, it felt like they were setting something up and then it didn't happen. So I don't know if there was a studio note. Maybe maybe originally it did, like, end up with her saying something that was like, holy crap, that was, you know, and someone, the studio balked. And then hopefully cleaned up after themselves. I will say that first swap was, like, legitimately a fun bit of, like, yeah, the... Seeing the the different ones deal with finding themselves in a completely different place was was fun and <laughs> yeah, Fury is like um, Kamala, you're at a one hundred million. I need you to be at like a two. And. Yeah, um, really great to see Kamala's family again, and very fun to see, like, her geeking out over, you know, Carol Danvers was in this house? You know, just, yeah. And I gotta admit, when the Skrulls and Den Bar, Darben... Yeah, if I said it wrong, it's a, it's a, in addition to being a weird comic book name, it's one I haven't heard before I started watching this movie. You know, there's, there's other weird comic book names that I'm, you know, more familiar with. But, yeah, um, the, f the, the, um, when Dar Ben is like talking to the Skrulls and she's like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna work this out. I thought that the movie was gonna do a thing of like, you know, I, a Cree, got the Skrulls a new homeworld. Carol Danvers, who promised you one, she didn't. But then that's not where it goes at all. So it's, and it's also like, I mean. On Secret Invasion, they specifically said, you know, we, we couldn't find a place that you could stay. So, we stopped looking, and it's like, no, but they have a place. Yeah, it's just, you know, at, at this point, the, the continuity is not completely holding up. It, it used to be much more... Yeah. In the MCU. But yeah, we learn that the Kree world of Hala is dying. The the air and sun, and technically, it is the fault of of Carol Danvers. She didn't realize the consequences. And uh, let's see. and you know that is it is one of those things of 
you know, technically what we see happen to Hala, you know, yeah, that's what's happening to Earth. And the, the, yeah, um, I don't think the movie is intentionally saying that it's a bad idea to, like, redirect resources and such, because, like, in real life, that is something that is, like, holy crap. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I think it might be, because the, these movies are made by liberals and not hard left people. Uh, yeah, in real life, no, it is not going to destroy the universe to, to redirect some resources. That is not a, a thing that's, you know, that's, that's, I'm sure that's how the rich people feel, which, you know, I agree. They, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to cause no anxiety for rich people to do these things. I'm just saying that's what therapy's for. And yeah, I, I quite liked when, you know, Goose spat out some, some Cree that were, you know, it, it swallows them up and then spits them back out. Which is, of course, how we get Cree in the Khan household, despite the fact that they were on this other planet before, you know. And and that does set up, yeah, you know, evidently now it is possible for a Florkin to, to swallow you up and spit you back out still living. That didn't really seem like it was the case in the first movie, but I'm glad for the change because it... The scene of Cat's memories, I think it's, you know, pr playing as, as a bunch of kittens, you know, run after and then swallow a, a bunch of people on the space station, that was, that was a lot of fun. That was, yeah. And, yeah, I, I quite liked... Uh, the the Khan family fighting these Kree warriors and I really loved the bit that like there's one point where one of the Kree is about to to attack Yusuf seemingly in a way that might kill him and Muniba without hesitation like dives in front you know really like of uh, um the the devotion there you know and yeah, they do have some fun action as the three swap bodies. And I do quite like that, like, clearly someone working on this has a cat or ha has had, you know. Because at one point, like, Goose, like, helps out fighting and then just walks off disinterested, you know, just, yeah very very credible and yeah uh, Muniba points out wait you were having us under surveillance you know which also that feels like something that would have been on the the show as well you know and and you know Kamala is like you know my name you know it's just and and yeah I mean Monica makes a good point. You were the you're the hero of of Jersey, and you know your powers are light based. My powers are light based. We were, you know, making sure just uh, yeah. And <laughs> Kamala wrote a letter that she was gonna you know, uh, if, you know when I meet Carol Danvers, I I want to give her the the letter that just yeah. And. Yeah, and then we have the tense reunion between Carol and Monica. And we have that thing of, you know, Carol essentially still, you know, she, she sees Monica and to some extent she still sees this little kid. You know, so her first instinct is to call her Lieutenant Trouble and Monica is like uncomfortable and says, no, it's, it's Captain Rambo. Which, you know, Carol does, you know, agree to, to 
say f from then on. But yeah, the you know that is something. There are a lot of people who you know if if yeah they they don't want to be seen as a as a kid or teenager anymore. And. Yeah, a uh, very tense mid-air rescue of Monica, you know, yeah, rescuing Kamala Khan. And... Yeah, and the hold that thought was a cute running gag. And yeah, I like the bit where they they swap places in the same location. And yeah, uh, Dar Ben blames, you know, yeah, says the scrolls must have called upon Carol Danvers. And. <laughs> Very, very cute when, let's see, I think, yeah, I think it's it's Kamala, you know, she wasn't present when Carol was told by Monica about Kamala, so, yeah, you know, when Kamala and Carol are first face-to-face, -face, Carol already, you know, yeah, so she says Kamala, and Kamala's like, you know my name? And it's just, it's so adorable, just, she's it's absolutely adorable. And, you know, she says, don't use your powers. We save, you know, we have to save who we can. Because she does use her powers and it, you know, yeah, it's a it's a risk. I really thought that was going to go, that there was going to be like an emotional exchange, you know. But then a little later, you know, Carol is like, I'm sorry I talked to you like that. Kamala's like, I'm sorry I should have been more careful. And that's it. Just, yeah, I, I really felt like there was something there. You know, they could, yeah, the homecoming did a really great job of exploring this thing of you know this teenager who just wants to be as as big as the their idol, and and the idol having to be the adult in the room and say no, you're you're being too careless here. And, yeah, so Valkyrie provides shelter for the Skrulls and talks to, to Carol. And I really appreciate, like, Tessa Thompson, you know, this could easily have been, like, cashing paycheck kind of thing. Even in very little screen time, she's still, like, the body language, like, just, if I, if I didn't see her face... But I just saw like the rest of her body. I would immediately be like, "Oh, that's Valkyrie. That's definitely Valkyrie." You know, just the the vibe really comes through, and I I really respect that. And yeah, we're we're told you know Carol destroyed the supreme intelligence, which you know I I have to admit it's been a little while since I looked, but I believe the. Supreme Intelligence Marvel. Yeah, yeah. Um, it the the way it looked in this when she destroyed it is very accurate to what it looks like in the in the comics. So, yeah, you know, and and it is you know in in the first movie we were told no one can look directly upon the Supreme Intelligence you'd go mad. So, you know, setting up, there is a real, you know, there is one specific way that the Supreme Intelligence is meant to look. And we don't see it in that movie, we do see it here. So, yeah, I really respect that they went with this more comic accurate thing. And, and yeah, it is this thing of, you know, that is a problem in real life. If you take out, you know, a... a really powerful, you know, force for evil, 
you might create a power vacuum or or uh, that's not so much what happens there or you might leave people without the the control that you know es essentially like it's like how you know the the winners of world war 1 really took a lot from germany it's, yeah after after world war 1 before world war 2 and it actually paved the way for for hitler so yeah darben is like hitler in in that you know yeah that's that's a that that is something that we need to learn from we we can't let something like that happen again not making any excuses for hitler he was one of history's greatest monsters but he wouldn't have been able to take power the way he did if the the people had not felt humiliated by other countries and let's see yeah we yeah monica you know comes out and tells carol you know she's upset over all those years where she wasn't there and carol said you know i'm sorry i was needed elsewhere and Monica says, you were needed here. We we needed you, Carol. Which, yeah, good line. I, I really wish that it that they let it sit more and, and really explored it more. But I do really appreciate that it does lead to her apologizing. You know, we should all be able to apologize when we've done something wrong. And yeah, you know, it, it is like like the, the Wikipedia quote, she became a workaholic. And, you know, yeah, she... Oh, wait, the, let's see, that was after Endgame. Anyway, she, you know, people felt like, pe people who cared about her felt like she was not being the, the she wasn't there when they needed her and yeah that is something you know it can be very difficult and let's see yeah we have the 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 yeah a new you know, let's let's start over. You know, and handshake, and it's like, okay, so I, you know, I I hope you don't mind the fact that I I am using your name. I honestly never thought that I would actually get to meet you, and now here we are touching, and it's like, oh, please do not use that word in this particular. She's adorable. I, I, yeah, absolutely adorable. Just, it's, it's, <laughs> they knew what the, the, the screenwriters knew what they were doing. You know, she's not just saying, now that I'm shaking your hand, she specifically says, now that we're touching. And the, the thing with, you know, are we a team? And yeah, the, the bangle is a quantum band. I, I do really appreciate getting a clear answer on on that after all the the theorizing but yeah you know the the bangles the two part bangles are from the Cree and yeah one of them ended up on earth and with Khan's family and the other was still on the yeah I get was the other one never on Earth then? I guess maybe the yeah, cause like the guy it was like a cut off arm, so maybe one of the arms there and the other arm and the other yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and and Kamala is trying to help. So, ooh, I saw you know she had she had star charts in in her uh, to to where the stars and 
yeah, they do the the memory access and rewind like in the first one. They do get useful information. The yeah, it it did feel like the scene was there because it was effective in the first movie, and it really was effective. I I rewatched the first movie just a couple of days ago, and they really did a great job on uh, yeah and we see that Carol did talk to Maria you know when the the cancer returned and Monica had been dusted you know and then she wasn't you know C Carol hasn't contacted Monica since the 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 blip and yeah it it is the the kind of thing you can understand why monica well actually i guess is it possible that she's been open to reaching out and monica keeps turning it down i guess maybe but you know the the and i will say that was it was such a sweet moment and i'm sure there's a lot of like alpha macho you know ubermensch bro dudes who are gonna like be horrified but it was legitimately sweet when you know so so yeah monica opens up about the you know she lost her her mom and she misses her you know this is the first kamala kamala's hearing of it so she you know she goes up and she's, you know, she's hugging Monica, and Monica's like, I, I okay. And, uh, you know, she's like, you know, motioning for, for Carol to come home and join, and the, the three of them have, have a hug. And it's just, you know, yeah, sometimes that's what you need. Uh, you know, it's very, very sweet. Let's see. Yeah, and apparently the, the thing with the jump points is like fracking. So, there's a, yeah, I, yeah, that is, that is a, there's a, there's a comparison there, and <laughs> I, I did quite like the thing, you know, so, uh, let's see, uh, she needs, Dar Darben needs water. Oh, she's gonna go to a lab, a lab now. That's like ninety-seven point three percent water. Yeah. Oh wow, that was very specific. You you thought of that like real fast. Is there is there some kind of weird thing going on between you and Aladna? Um, consensus. Do we have consensus on Aladna then? And it's like, yeah, there's some there's something going on here. And Muniba calls in. You know, you can't go to space. Nicholas says it's dangerous, and it's you know, and and you know, we of course it's a call back to the fact that Fury only wants people to call him Fury, and if you call him Nicholas, that's like gonna gonna tip off. But it is also sweet this this thing of like she's Moniba's talking about Fury like oh you know friend of the you all you know Kamala you've met. Nicholas, you know, he's he's a you know longtime friend. He says space missions are dangerous, so no, you are not allowed to go on a space mission. Just and yeah, I'm I'm so glad that the family get more than one scene. Like from the trailer, I kind of thought, you know, oh, they're they're gonna have the conversation in the living room, and that's basically it. I really adore the montage of them using, you know, getting better, yeah, practicing using their powers together, and the thing with the, you know, okay, one, two, three, go. We're supposed to go. We were supposed to go on three. I, I know, I know. Just, yeah, really, really adorable, and the, 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 like they specifically use like I. I I feel I probably shouldn't even know this double dutch I think the the jump jumping rope thing like they 
I just really appreciate these three female writers sat down and thought of, okay, what is something that is like distinctly female? Like, maybe, maybe boys double dutch. But as far as I understand, it is distinctly something that like schoolgirls do. School girls, you know, and the fact that that's what they use, like, of all the things they could, and, and they do the thing where they're like, they put, they put books on their heads, on the top of their heads, and then they're walking like models. And it's like, again, I, you know, having never been, you know, I am not female, and I'm, I will not be female in the future, but I understand from various pieces of media that that is something, like, okay, so originally it was like a thing that, like, I don't know if it's actually been used or if it's only ever been, like, a joke, but apparently that's how you train for, like, being a, like, a, a runway model, like, if you're walking down the runway, you have to walk, you have to be able to walk in a way that if you had books on the top of your head, they would not fall off. I don't know if that's true or if it's just something that someone thought was a funny way to, to look at it or something, but it's popped up in, in like sitcoms and such. And here they do it as part of like practicing using the, just, yeah, like, Honestly, I think that's a scene where the fun that they had writing it really came through in in the movie itself. You know, I think there's there's other scenes where they probably had more fun writing than we ended up having watching it, but no, it was it was really really fun. I yeah, uh, very fun montage and yeah the Monica keeps turning down code names and Kamala keeps trying to brainstorm am, am I pronouncing is it Kamala or Kamala I swear I'm not doing it on purpose and Yusuf is trying to sell insurance to the 306 year old Dag is apparently the character name. That's really adorable. Like, he's in space and he's like going around. You never know. You know, it's, it's never too early or too late to think about retirement. You know, and, and the guy's like, wow, I never even thought about it. You know, and, and, you know, oh, 306 years old. And then Amir is like, oh, so you two are the same age. Which, yeah, that's a very, like, he's, like, in his 20s or 30s or something, and he's talking to his, like, boomer dad. That's a very, like, that's the kind of joke that someone like that would think of, yeah. And... I really appreciate the... So, so yeah, Carol says, okay, so... I'm kind of famous here. Don't don't make a big deal about it. Just I helped the prince with a legal issue, you know. And the yeah, she she's not yeah, eventually she she you know says, "Okay, so on this planet people sing, they they don't they don't talk. They they only communicate in song, which is just like such a fun it's it's one of those things where it's just like you know I wish I could live on that planet it must be so much fun to always be be like singing instead of instead of talking just yeah and, you know, she, yeah, she tries to disguise herself putting the thing over, you know, covering her face, but they pretty quickly, you know, oh, it's the princess, it's the princess. And, yeah, she has to admit to the others, yes, technically I am a princess on this planet, you know. And 
the girls tease, you know, two of the girls tease the third girl over her boyfriend. <laughs> and it's like, wow. Yeah, okay. You. It's, very girly. I'm just, I'm not saying that boys don't tease other boys about their, you know, partner, but it just, stereotypically speaking, that is a very girly, feminine kind of thing, and I'm here for it. I love when this movie just unabashedly, unashamedly just is a girly kind of, just, yeah. Also in part because the first movie is very, like, one of the boys, not like other girls kind of thing. You know, it's it's very much no, no, no. She's she's not a she's not actually a, she's not she's not a girl. Like she's she's cool and she's tough and she you know just yeah. I I really appreciate this being so much more like overtly girly. And yeah, um, Carol dances with the prince and sings and yeah. I mean. Brie Larson is a, a good singer. She she tried to make a career out of it, you know, some some years back. So yeah, I I appreciate them, you know, fitting the that talent of hers in here. And <laughs> the prince is bilingual. He he can he can talk. He doesn't have to sing, which does make it easier because it would have been pretty ridiculous if they just kept, but. Yeah, it was it was a ton of fun. The the planet. I I would watch a Disney Plus like limited series that was set entirely on this planet. And yeah, uh, Monica is like so. You're getting a lot of material for for Captain Marvel fanfic out of this, aren't you? Oh yeah, a lot of chapters. And yeah, Darben arrives on Aladna, and yeah, and she, you know, because Kamala still can't quite get herself to not use her powers, she accidentally swaps with the others. Darben sees the bangle on Kamala. Oh, Captain, my Captain. That's wow. So did she Did she watch that movie or did she read that book? Because like I feel like she's she's nerdy enough to have done either. I'm not saying that movie is in its in and of itself is inherently nerdy, but for someone of her age to have watched it that seems like a, like I watched it because I'm nerdy enough to have watched it. Yeah, I'm not technically quite old enough to. I, I was like way too young when it first came out. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, um, yeah, and and you know, Carol is like I can do this, and the others have to actually, yeah, the the. Yeah, she's she's not accepting limitations, which again, that is that is very difficult, especially when the world is constantly telling you, which is the case for for women, you know, constantly telling them, you know, no, you can't do that. So yeah, you, it's, that that can lead to to becoming kind of petty and and going against that. Just you know, and and yeah. So you know, sometimes you can, sometimes you you have to accept your limitations. And yeah, Kamala apologizes to to Carol, and Carol acknowledges. You know, she really did think destroying the AI would fix things, not break them. And yeah, the 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 problem was. You know, Carol hyper 
fixated on the idea of, well, it's this, you know, it's the supreme intelligence, it's this AI that is telling them to go to war. If I destroy the thing, that's going to do, you know, and, and it's like, no, that by itself is, is not enough, which I acknowledge the movie itself doesn't actually acknowledge. It just says, no, it was wrong because now, you know, they, they struggle to, to get things to work without the, the supreme intelligence, which actually, yeah, thinking more about it, wait, does that mean that we should let warring leaders just, yeah, it's not, it's not a perfect message there, but I do really appreciate, like, a lot of the MCU up to this point has been like, okay, you gotta, you gotta find the, you gotta pinpoint who is the source of this thing, take him out, that's gonna, then everything is good forever. You know, so I really appreciate this one saying, no, that's not, because that really is not realistic. Like, if you, if you look at history, like, a ton of bad things specifically came from someone said, okay, this is what we need to do, and then they did it, and just left it at that. You know, they didn't rebuild. And, yeah, Carol and Monica reunite. And, yeah, they talk about, you know, they have to warn Fury. And, yeah, it is very much, you know, Darben is getting revenge on Carol. And, yeah, we see the, the eggs contain flurkin, so we are literally herding cats. I will say it was very funny watching, like, Carol, you know, Carol Danvers witnesses a flurkin, like, you know, blah, swallowing up a, a person and closing the mouth, and she goes, uh-uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. you know, like, try, trying to, you know, like, like you would a cat if it ate something that it was supposed to, like, just, um, like, a living person just went inside that thing's mouth, and she's acting like, no, no, you're not supposed to eat that. Open up, open up, open up, hmm? You know, just, that was just, yeah, someone, someone working on this has or has had a cat, and knows exactly how you deal with those, and appreciates how unbelievably funny it is. See, the flirkin thing is really funny in the first movie, but... I think it works even better here. the The fact that people act like, "Oh, it's whatever. It's a, it's a cat," you know. The the yeah. I I really felt like that worked. Let's see. And yeah, the the message. You know, please stop running. Let the flurkins eat you, you know, and, and the montage of, yeah, that was really, really fun. I honestly, I, I laughed harder at that bit than I have at any MCU thing in, in a long time. Like, that was, like, it, it got to a point where I was like, oh my god, I have to, I have to be more quiet than this. Or I'm gonna like ruin someone else's movie going experience. But it was it was so funny. Just and yeah, Darben is going to try to take the Earth Sun. Very moving when the Khan family say goodbye. And the you know, are you praying? Yeah. No, keep going, please. We we need all the help we can get. I, I really appreciate, like, you know, the, this, the, the MCU has gotten a lot of mileage out of Islamophobia and post-9-11 anxieties and, and such. So for them to, like, specifically, because that's the thing, like, you know, if you hear a Muslim praying, that doesn't mean they're a terrorist. They pray, you know... Yeah, Muslims pray, Christians pray, various, people of various faiths pray. It doesn't mean they have any ill intent. 
and yeah, the this situation, you know, they're they're scared they're they're about to die, so you know, the the yeah, one of them starts praying. That's uh, completely yeah. And yeah, Darben fight the tr fights the trio, which not bad. And yeah, she's like basically stabbed and you know, she has the line death follows you to to Carol and yeah, you know, that is legitimately, you know, if if you that it's something I, I really appreciate because at the end of the first movie, it acts like the fact that she's able to to destroy all these Kree warships as just a oh it's, it's look at how badass she is look at how cool that is it doesn't actually acknowledge I mean uh, don't get me wrong she prevents a genocide so obviously it is an it is a net positive but I mean there were people on those warplanes, you just killed a lot of people that you could have forced to surrender, you know, so it's, yeah, the, the, because that, that's the thing, like, it could easily have been written to where, you know, once she destroys all the warheads, you know, then they just agree to leave for, for Kree airspace, but that wasn't seen as cool enough, so no, she kills a bunch of people you know, just, yeah, and and you know, here it points out, oh, death seems to follow you, doesn't it? You know, everywhere you go, people die, and that's you know, that bothers her. It should bother her, you know, and yeah, she, you know, by the end of the movie, she's restarted their their son because that's another thing, you know. With, with powers like that, you can destroy, or you can create. And... Yeah, um, let's see... Darben takes Kamala Khan as hostage, but the, the bangles melt her, and let's see, yeah, she opens the, the jump point and yeah very cool like they they really managed to raise the stakes here at the end i love the the giant hand that that kamala makes to to get them back and the the yeah space time hole the energy punch and then, yeah, you know, as the as she is closing the, the jump point, Monica is trapped on the other side. Uh, you know, Carol did not get close enough to to bring her back. And yeah, Kamala tells Fury about Monica's sacrifice. And, yeah, Carol reignites the son of Hala. And I really appreciate, you know, yeah, she goes to Hala and, like, we know she's strong enough. She could, like, attack them or terrify them. But instead, she, she restarts the sun. And it actually points out, you know, yeah, these, these Kree, you know, they've done some really terrible things. But they're still, like, human, well, alien beings. You know, they they feel and think they they're afraid and yeah they turned to this maniacal leader because they felt like they were you know they they legitimately felt yeah actually in this case they they were actually experiencing this threat to their very existence and that's the kind of thing you know carol should maybe have been more yeah she she should have been more careful here she should early in the story what she does here at the end is good but that that is a thing that a lot of times throughout history you know someone really powerful 
you know, usually it's not an individual with superpowers, it's, you know, someone with political power or military power, that sort of thing. But they do a thing that they, you know, maybe they think it's the right thing to do, maybe it's just because they feel like it, they, they, you know, maybe it's a status thing or something. But they don't stop and think, wait, what will this do to the people? You know, so, yeah, I really appreciate that being addressed here. And, yeah, we go to Louisiana, and now Carol is waiting for Monica to return. So it's the reverse of what it was before. And, let's see, yeah, and, and then we get Kamala imitating Fury from the end of Iron Man, from the post credit scene of Iron Man 1. Did you think you were the only superhero in the world? Did you think you were only young superhero in the world? You've just entered a larger universe, which, okay, so far it's just you, me, and... I hear Ant Man has a daughter, has a teenage daughter. You know, just and and yeah. Um, seriously, bring on the Young Avengers! Cannot wait. Just so great to see. And and yeah, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna bring in Kate Bishop, you gotta have at least a little bit of Pizza Dog there. And yeah, you know, um, can't believe I'm blanking on the the actor's name. But it was really great seeing Haley Steinfeld again. And let's see. Right, and yeah, as you know, at the end of it, you know, I'd like you to you know, some something like I'd like you to talk to you about the, the Young Avenger initiative. So will you join? Please? <laughs> And, and it felt very true to both characters uh, that bit. And, um, yeah, speaking of, like, actors that I'm glad to see reprise Marvel roles, holy crap, Kelsey Grammer back as, as Beast. And, yeah, it says here just voice. Let's see, was it a different... I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that was his physical performance. But but the um, I I quite appreciate like we all agree this is not this is not really up for debate um, the makeup for Beast in X Men Three spot on absolutely perfect I like that here they actually this is a different version of that they they didn't try to like reinvent the wheel they just went with you know a, a different very cool it has this. Uh, it it always reminds me of like basically like a, like a cat kind of thing, like maybe a, a a puma or some a, a cat creature feline of, of some sort you know where like the more classic beast that we get in X Men three and you know a lot of the older comics is more of like a big like guy with fur all over so yeah I really appreciate that they they do this slightly different yeah. And, yeah, the, the mid-credits, you know, Monica does not have any powers. Maria is there, but does not recognize, you know, she, she's like, Mom, what are you talking about? You know, she, this, is, this is a, and, and, you know, Beast calls her binary. So this is a parallel universe where Maria got powers, which I, th well, let's see. Does that mean that she was the one? Because they earlier in this movie they bring up, you know, oh, the the only reason that Carol got powers rather than Maria getting those those powers was that she, you know, she won the race. And I think this is a parallel universe where Maria won that race, got the powers, and yeah, took on the 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 identity of binary. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, it ends with Maria asking Monica, "Who are you?" And 
you know, we get a mention of, you know, Charles would like a report. So, yeah. Um, geeking out about it. Gonna, gonna try to be coherent here. Because it would be very easy for me to simply just freak out about the fact that this totally means that they can actually maintain the fact that in the in the comics and in the 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 Fox X-Men movies Magneto survived the Holocaust and that's actually a really big part of his origin story and obviously if they did not do this parallel universe thing well if you know Magneto becomes a big deal in the present day in the mainline MCU well I mean he can't have been if if he was in the Holocaust and there were like mutants around since then, it would have come up come up at some point over the course of these movies. Which although I guess this does mean that the because they like they also implied that Kamala was a mutant with the you know there's a mutation in your genes. It's not like your family's genes. So I guess they're just throwing stuff at the wall. I think this makes a lot of sense. I, I really do hope that the parallel universe is how they introduce the X-Men. I've, I've been saying this for years. This is the way to do it, to maintain the... the just... I, I, I really am not a fan of the idea that, oh, the X-Men have been around, but, like, they just never interfere. They never save the world... In, in any of the, just, no, that, that feels way too, because there's no way that you would be able to hide it from absolutely everyone for all of this time, you know, so, no, I, I really, I'm, I'm glad that this is how they're, how they're doing it, and, yeah, um, the next MCU movie, I believe, is Deadpool 3, so that one's gonna, Go further down the, you know, this this op this this is a peek through a keyhole. That one's gonna open the door at least slightly, maybe entirely, and we're gonna start seeing X Men appear in MCU stuff. I hope that they don't let it like get out of hand. I'd, I'd rather them introduce just a few here and there, but honestly, if they end up introducing a, you know, just a metric ton of them. I think there is a way that they could also make that work without it just becoming just excessive. But yeah, I I, I mentioned in the review that some people are probably going to say, "Oh, this shouldn't be you know post credit scene, for, mid credit scene for this," because you know, oh, it's like you know, not you know, there's a lot of people who love the X Men who don't care about the Marvels. I mean, I think that's part of why that it specifically appears here, you know, to make sure that people, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, you can just, you can read about it. You don't need to have watched this entire movie if you really don't. But, like, if you read comic books, you know, sometimes they do put major reveals in books that are not necessarily the ones they expect. Okay, this is going to be the very biggest deal you know, and it's not like this was some nothing of a movie that nobody knew about. You know, they 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 advertised this. So, but yeah, uh, I think that is all that I have to say about this. So yeah, um, really, really stoked. They they. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to more mutants in the MCU, and one of the things that was supposed to be in the first Fox X-Men movie was Logan being tended to by Beast as a, you know, doctor kind of, you know, but they, you know, I th uh, let's see, I think, was it budget? I think they weren't sure they could make the effect look good. So they ended up combining Gene and Beast, which is also good because 
Gene did not have that much to do in the original script. You know, all the science stuff in that first X-Men movie, that was supposed to be Beast, which leaves Jean Grey with very little other than, like, oh, she reads, she reads a couple of minds, and the, the, you know, uses the, 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 yeah, anyway. Originally, Beast was supposed to be tending to this confused protagonist character, the audience, you know, surrogate. And here we actually did get that. So that's a neat little, uh, you know, like, Kevin Feige, you finally did get that in there, because he did work on that first X-Men movie, you know, and he was, the it was because of Kevin Feige that Beast says, oh, my stars and garters, in the the third movie so I can imagine he was one of the people who were really hoping we'd have beast in the you know yeah tending to to this confused protagonist character and yeah here we are 23 years later so yes that that is it for this video let me know in the comment section what was, you know, yeah, what did you, what made you laugh the hardest in this movie? What did you think was, like, the sweetest or most meaningful character moment? Do, did you think that there were things that should have been rewritten that I didn't get into in this video? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one to more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, when applicable, which these days is Loki, as soon as they put out another Star Wars Disney Plus show. I will also do that. I do a weekly vlog about a horror thing, which these days is an episode of Blood Curse. I try to do a daily, it doesn't always end up being every single day, vlog talking about an episode of a piece of Marvel TV, which, you know, right now I am early in season three of. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm doing basically everything Marvel TV that I hadn't already done in the order in which it hit the, yeah, in order of release. I was about to say hit TV, but some of it was streaming from the start that is on Disney+. Plus. I, uh, I want to say, let's see, it's Runaways. Runaways is no longer on Disney Plus. If it goes back, I'll I'll do it when that happens. And let's see, recently the Ruin Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And yeah. The the they they should they should have Flurkin on all major craft in the future in case of a of a crash and they can get a very disgusting rescue. <laughs>